Hi, and welcome to another edition of Forward Thinking. This time, we're going to sit down with three representatives from the digital nations. If you don't know who they are, the DN started out as a small group of progressive governments who shared their best practices around open government and digital innovation. And the number has now grown to 10 countries from around the world who share these kinds of best practices. Last year, we actually hosted the Digital Nations at Forward 50 as Canada was the host country in a rotating series of events they run. And this year, the Digital Nations is gonna to return to the Forward 50 stage to share with us three case studies on November 4th around the world, things that people have been doing to enable digital government to take off better, share data more openly and work better with citizens. So please join me in giving a very warm forward thinking welcome to three members of the Digital Nation, Gosia, Sam, and Natalia. Hi, everyone. How are you? Hi, Alastair. All good. Thank you. Uh, Gosia, where are you calling in from today? Um, I'm calling in from uh, Geneva, actually. Uh, but uh, this is where I'm based, and I am the official in the UK government. I work for the uh, Department for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport, and I'm the head of Global Governance, uh, which is a team that leads our multilateral engagements, and part of that is the Digital Nations. So I also chair um, the Digital Nations this year as the UK holds the presidency. That sounds pretty busy. And how about you, Sam? Where are you today? Hey, Alistair. Yeah, so I'm uh, I'm calling in from London. Uh, I'm the, uh, the the head of open data and open government policy in the, in the UK Cabinet Office. So work very closely with Gosha and others. Uh, and my kind of remit in the Digital Nations is that I also chair the Data 360 group. So that's the uh, the group that kind of focuses on, on on open data and data infrastructure and all that good stuff. I actually just finished while we're waiting for an Italian to rejoin us. Uh, I actually just finished recording eleven short ten or twelve minute talks on data. Um, I wrote a book called Lean Analytics, and then I taught a course at HBS on data science and critical thinking. So I decided to put those into these talks and we published them, you know, hey, everybody, here's some free content. We're dropping like one on Monday and one on Wednesday for the next 10 weeks, I think, or five weeks. Um, but a number of people signed up who had nothing to do with government just because they want to understand how to think about data and, and stuff like that. And it, it really does feel like uh, in the current sort of political climate and an innovation climate, uh, knowing how to think critically about data is, is and, and sharing that data openly is such a, a vital part of technology in general. Yeah, we think about it in terms of data literacy uh, in the UK. And, and, and I think the, the trick is that we're trying to kind of hit the top level. So the senior thinkers, the sort of senior decision makers, trying to make them comfortable with the concept of data. But we're also trying to hit the working level as well and trying to make sure we have the right data scientists, data engineers and kind of analyst uh, analyst expertise at that level as well. So it's a it's a really important uh, issue. And it's great that you're uh, you're doing some content on that. But it's super challenging just to get that last mile to make it sort of relevant to the audience. I mean, Something I'm constantly doing is just trying out my explanations on on muggles, people who aren't sort of indoctrinated in the world of data science, uh, just to see if that stuff makes sense. Because uh, so many of the concepts we understand as as data people and technologists, uh, you know, standard deviation and means and why averages are terrible ways to understand data sets, those are not things that, the, that most people think about. So it's uh, it's definitely a literacy I wish we had more of. So Gosia, um, tell me a little about the themes that um, the DN is working on this year and, and where they came from. Absolutely. So um, this year, our overall theme is digital government in open society, sustainable, inclusive and values driver, uh, driven innovation. Um, so the theme uh, has been chosen by the UK as chair this year, but it really um, is uh, one that is shared by all of our uh, partners in the digital nations. And it's one that is also guiding our other engagements um, this year, especially within the G7 presidency and also later in the year uh, during COP. And the most critical part here is really the open societies and the values that we're trying to make sure are embedded throughout the uh, digital transformation in the government. Um, it's very important and critical piece of work that we are trying to focus all of our um, work strands of the digital nations on um, and making sure that we, through that digital um, uh, transformation, meet the needs of, of people, of businesses, whether that's delivery of healthcare, social support, uh, education or, or anything else. 
Um, and for that reason, um, it, with the increasing sort of reliance on digital technologies and, and the accelerating pace of that transformation, we really, really strongly believe that we need to be guided by the shared values as democratic societies. Um, and so the, the key here is the public trust. Uh, that is really paramount to the success of the adoption of the digital technologies and making sure that there is transparency and public confidence, um, in, especially in the public sector use of data and digital technologies, um, and making sure that things like transparency of algorithmic decision making um, is embedded, as well as safeguards, human rights, ethics, um, and anything uh, in between in our approaches to the digital transformation. Um, so then uh, the concept of inclusion is one other one that is particularly important now um, uh, during the pandemic. And what the pandemic has shown us is how important and vital uh, it is to no one to, to leave no one behind. Um, and so uh, we want to make sure that we understand all of the considerations of variety of different needs in a society. And so being inclusive digital government is really a priority for us in the UK and for the digital nations and, and all of our partners. Um, and so, for example, we're trying to uh, make sure that we design for accessibility, that we build digital skills and confidence in the public, but also within the civil service itself as an exemplar, um, and that we uh, make sure that there is a wide access to technologies and digital tools, especially in underserved communities. Um, and then the last piece of that uh, theme is the sustainability. And again, as, I, as I've mentioned, um, we also host a COP um, um, meeting later in the year and so it is really critical for us to make sure that this is the central theme uh, in the digital nations work as well we we know very well that the technological advances can help us to drive down our carbon footprint but we're also very aware of the negative consequences of of technologies and so these need to be properly managed. Um, so we hope that um, together we can promote more of the shared understanding of how to build a sustainable digital governments and make sure that we lower that environmental um, impact um, of our digital operations in the government. Um, so these are the, the things that we will be discussing, um, what they have been, what have been discussing and are working on throughout the year, but spe specifically we'll be discussing in this, uh, at the summit in November uh, when our ministers meet uh, to once again reconfirm really the, the commitment to uh, driving the progress in, in the digital transfer, transformation, um, especially based on the, the, the values of open societies and inclusivity, sustainability, um, and democratic principles. Uh, that's a, an auspicious and daunting list, and obviously a lot of the right things on the list, but many of those topics are sort of... Um, hard to digest for mainstream politicians who want to, you know, captivate the popular vote, targeting the margins to make sure they're included um, versus the objections of the mainstream or the middle um, austerity that might have to happen around carbon sequestration or, you know, restricting cargo ships. I think I read somewhere that the sulfur oxide uh, transmission of the 15 world's largest uh, container ships is equivalent to 760,000 cars or some you know, million cars, some insane number. Um, the, 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 thing, the tensions between what the public wants and what government has to do to meet some of these guidelines for transparency, which sort of lays all of a government's dirty laundry um, to bear for people to inspect uh, carbon and climate change uh, battles, which obviously lead to some form of austerity. Um, many of these initiatives seem to run counter to the political tide. Um, and no, nothing has really changed that as much as the pandemic has. Uh, really, the last 18 months have been a Sisyphean effort by governments around the world to try and deal with a deluge of digital information, a population that's massively online, and the rise of misinformation. So. Um, how has the pandemic influenced or shifted any of those changes? And, and Gossi, maybe you can start and then Sam, you're welcome to chime in. Absolutely. So, you know, I think actually it, it the pandemic has not really changed any of the priorities, but it kind of reinforced the need for, for us as digital nations to do the work that we have already been doing. Uh, and specifically, um, kind of reinforce the collective determination to find ways to deliver and be more innovative and be um, more collaborative and, and, and that cooperation internationally has become really 
critical during the pandemic and it showed us how important it is to share best practice, to be engaged with, with different governments who are struggling with the same big challenges and, and making sure that they deliver for the public. Um, and so it is uh, critical for us to engage and we always do that on the basis of uh, open source and um, and very sort of collaborative and genuine exchange and support to one another. Um, and so uh, that's really been sort of reinforced even more through through the pandemic. Um, and one other thing that did happen though um, has been an introduction of of a slightly different model because so far we have been working on the basis of annual work plans within an established set of uh, thematic working groups on AI, on sustainable IT, on data, on digital identity. Um, but what we have seen through the pandemic is the need to be even more agile um, and do more um, and be quicker in what we what we sort of share and where the priorities lie. And so we have been able to introduce a, a set of um, short term projects that wouldn't necessarily be uh, common for all of us, all of the 10 countries, but that particular two or three governments could work on. Um, and so uh, we would then be able to do more than than as we thus far have been in, in the whole group of 10. Um, That's a super interesting point that the fact that you were able to meet digitally, um, you know, there used to be this idea of, oh, we'll talk about it next year at the annual meeting. And it was a nice sort of waypoint. Now with the facility of setting up a meeting being a few clicks away, it seems like you no longer need to be beholden to this one year cycle, right? Absolutely. So it's it's been both a challenge, but also uh, an enabler. So definitely meetings virtually that have been happening have been a lot uh, easier to uh, to set up, and it's it's more off as well. Um, at the same time, we're dealing with a lot of different um, time zones, so uh, we do have colleagues who wake up at three a.m. to join us. Uh, so a massive thanks to all of those. Um, but uh, it has been happening in an, on a sort of a lot more agile way than than before. That's true. And Sam, what how has the pandemic shifted uh, or influenced DN priorities from your perspective? Yeah, so it's, it's a really interesting point. And I think uh, going back to one of Ghosh's uh, points around being a challenge and an enabler. So the challenge that we've really hit is, a, is that we had a plan. You know, we, uh, my, my group, the, the Data360 group, uh, even my, my team in government, we, we had a plan for last year that got completely kind of scrapped. So we wanted to look at things like data standards. We wanted to look at things like, you know, really kind of technical, nerdy things around data. Like, you know, how are we, how are we collecting and using data? How are we kind of, you know, sharing stuff? And, you know, the, that, that was the challenging part, but the enabler was really that, you know, we had to start getting quicker about all of those things. And so what we ended up doing was rather than focusing on a kind of a, a very kind of, you know, um, year long program of, of, of talking about all these different aspects, we actually ended up having to practice these things as a result of the pandemic. So, you know, within our respective 10 governments, we had to kind of figure out how do we share data more efficiently? How do we collect data more effectively? And how do we kind of, you know, start using data to answer these questions um, to help stem the tide of the infections and all, all the rest of the things, you know, things like the, the various lockdowns that we've had here in the UK, they've been informed by the data and we had to kind of figure out a way to work more quickly. So that informed our kind of work plan for the digital nations. And so rather than focusing on this kind of longer term piece, we've actually been kind of working on a, a collaboration looking specifically at you know data use throughout this throughout this process and throughout this kind of period which is is kind of altered the way we've worked but that's the the enabling aspect of this i guess again where we've been able to move more quickly we've been able to kind of call out more interesting kind of case studies that are directly resulting from the pandemic and and, and we've had a lot more kind of data heavy work happening across the 10 nations and the other thing i would say in you know just reiterating what goshi was saying about the agile nature of all of this is that you know the 10 nations of the digital nations um it's not a big group like 10 countries in terms of multilaterals is not a huge group you know we work with others where there are you know in some cases you know tens if not if not hundreds of different countries involved so that enables us to have a little bit more of a frank exchange uh that, than we would in other in other forums and so that's again enabled us to kind of when we are looking at data things when we are looking at different kind of best practice models we're able to kind of call on these other nations and have these kind of frank and open conversations in ways that we wouldn't have uh through other through other kind of um bilateral or, or multilateral discussions so that's been another you know huge uh, benefit of digital nations throughout this kind of uh, period it's changed how we've worked but i think it's in in some ways shown more effective ways of working so natalia welcome back uh, sorry about the technical issues i know uh, sometimes recording these things can be mean to uh, uh, computer infrastructure uh, where are you joining us from today 
Hi everyone, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here with you today. So I'm joining you from London, from the Central Digital and Data Office, where I'm the head of data ethics. And uh, in Digital Nations, I lead the working group on artificial intelligence. Awesome. Uh, the data ethics and AI are pretty hot topics these days for a number of reasons. So Natalia, as Gosia and Sam have showed us, there's a, a daunting amount of stuff to do here around uh, Data360 stuff and identity and inclusion. What would you say are the biggest obstacles uh, to implementing the, those kinds of focuses within the DN? And also, like, what are the biggest enablers? What's making it easier to do that? How have things changed since last year? Sure. So I would say in terms of obstacles, the biggest obstacle that we've encountered in the AI working group has actually been the logistics and uh, issues related to the lack of resources and um, the fact that many people across the digital nations countries have been redeployed uh, to various emergency COVID projects and um, quite simply didn't have as much time and as, um, as many opportunities to really dedicate uh, their their time and efforts to this work. On the other hand, this has also been a really interesting enabler because it gave us a source of case studies for various data ethics dilemmas and challenges in practice, especially in this really dynamically changing crisis environment. So, um, so once we once we've managed to get used to the new normal and um, and overcome all these challenges that came with uh, working remotely, as Gosha and Sam mentioned earlier we've um, actually managed to establish a very supportive, a very active network that, um, that essentially helped us discuss some of the very fresh, very emerging challenges in data ethics uh, when using artificial intelligence. It, and, it does uh, seem like it's been a, a lightning rod for certain issues like digital identity, um, you know, which people were sort of avoiding and gingerly sidestepping and there's no way to avoid it now. So at least we had those conversations, right? Exactly, and I think one important thing that uh, that I am personally grateful for is that um, after after the past well, fifteen months, let's say, we don't have to explain why we need data ethics, why we need art the ethics of artificial intelligence. I think after we've seen various issues and um, various challenges play out in practice, everyone understands that this is a really, really key priority for not just digital nations, but uh, every government in the world, really. And um, I think we've been able to, to use that to our benefits and um, collaborate on some of the, the most cross-cutting and, um, and innovative projects that um, look at various applications of uh, AI ethics in practice. Uh, Sam, have you, I mean, there's many other issues besides just COVID, obviously, the whole BLM movement, um, the Black Lives Matter movement in the US sort of spilled out around the world, obviously, but also gave us much more um, discourse around marginalization and, and the inherent biases of AI and training data. Uh, have you seen that have an effect on um, the implementation of your focuses this year as well? I think it's an interesting question. I think in, in a way it's been an enabler for us again because that, that kind of uh, singular focus and that kind of, I guess, world focus on these issues has actually made it a lot easier for us to have these conversations. And so we work very closely with our counterparts across civil society. So, you know, your external groups, you know, the bodies that kind of look into these things. And so, you know, they've always been calling for more transparency around things like uh, disaggregated information, you know, things like uh, intersectional analysis, gender, um, race, you know, these are the kind of markers that, that, that we're asking for uh, or being asked for outside of government. And so these, these kind of, you know, I guess, cross-cutting issues, these things that are kind of cultural uh, within the zeitgeist all of a sudden, that, that means that it's easier for us to have these conversations and kind of make that case. Uh, and so, yeah, they've been real, that, that's been a real enabler for us. I also think that what's been interesting has been one of the biggest obstacles, I guess, when it comes to data specifically, is that when you're talking about, a, 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 you know, 10 different nations, and you're talking about different ways that we do things, it's actually kind of hard to find uh, similarities in some ways, because the case studies and the ways that we all kind of operate, in some cases can be quite different, you know, it can be radically different in the ways that we all kind of work. But when you're talking about these kind of cross-cutting issues, things that haven't been looked at, you know, even going back to the pandemic, it's actually fo kind of focused our minds and it's focused all these different nations on specific outcomes and, and needing to do things in specific ways. And that's meant that actually for the first time ever, there's been a lot more unity in the way that we've done things. And actually that's enabled us to be more comparable. So we're able to now look across and see where things are actually very close to what we're trying to do, or things are kind of, you know, uh, the outcomes that we're aiming for are much more similar. And that's actually enabled a much like kind of uh, a much more 
close reading of the way that we work and a much more kind of collaborative way of working as well. So, so yeah, we've seen, we've seen a huge amount of these uh, over the last uh, 15 months or so, for sure. It does seem like uh, any good metric is comparative. And so now that you've got a baseline, you can see where you're actually moving. So we've, we've entered into a, a second phase of government deployment of data science where now we can at least compare it to the first phase. So we have some context. Uh, Natalia, from an AI point of view, about a year ago, I had a forward thinking conversation with a few um, public servants who are in the, sci in the product management side of things. And I asked them about AI and they were unequivocally pessimistic. They were like, look, there's so much low hanging fruit in government, just just data, mod just modernization and fixing, you know, b forms and turning them into useful things. And there's so many low hanging fruits. Why would we waste our time on AI? Now, as someone who's a big fan of, of tech and what it can do, I obviously uh, take that with a grain of salt. But um, is your sense that that AI um, and the innovative use of AI in the public sector um, is increasing? And if so, where do you see it happening in ways that the sort of naysayers who are like, let's walk before we can run, will still find it useful? So I would say the innovative use of AI is definitely increasing. And um, when chairing this group, I, I have seen some wonderful examples from the digital nations countries where they used AI projects that perhaps weren't as complex or as difficult to establish from the technical point of view, but actually made a very big impact on the on the part of the public that they was that they were aimed to serve. So, for example, Korea have a really fantastic AI-based sign language translation system, which helps people with uh, hearing loss understand various online and offline information uh, within the public space. And um, there are some excellent examples from Estonia as well, for example, and their and their virtual state assistance um, that helps citizens with their issues. So. We see we see a whole range of projects starting from from automating simple tasks and simple interactions with uh, the public sector, uh, such as chatbots, for example, or various translation services that technically are not that complex. And then we see all the other more creative um, uses of AI, perhaps. And um, and and I think one trend that um, that I've observed and that we can definitely see in this group is uh, how important ethics and um, and using AI to, to advance various um, wider socioeconomic goals has been. And um, the fact that all those projects are um, in most countries, in, in all the countries really are assessed against all the potential risks. I think that should be one argument um, for all the skeptics that um, now we, we're getting to this point when we're able to, to innovate in the public sector, but we're also doing this in a responsible manner. And um, because we have this platform, the Digital Nations AI Working Group, we are actually able to discuss various issues, uh, discuss all the challenges that come up and um, and really help each other out. And this is, I think this has been one of the greatest, um, th that has been the source of the greatest value of this group at least, because we um, some of the conversations that we've had were, were very sort of, practical and almost like how did you manage to achieve that please help us and um and i think that's um that's really where we can all succeed and where we can all um, demonstrate on a global level that um that a responsible um innovative use of ai long term is possible i mean a lot of these issues seem like game theory right uh you know the the, the prisoner's dilemma idea of two people who've been arrested and are separated and they face a choice. You can rat the other person out and self serve yourself, or you can stay silent and both of you go to jail for a shorter time. Um, it seems like in many of these debates, there's a country that um, may want to break those rules and find an unfair advantage. Uh, one of the most frightening conversations I've ever had uh, was about seven years ago, I was at an event in, auto in uh, Washington, DC. And I met a very highly placed person in government who said, we've already looked at the game theory around AI. And we've realized that if two nation states start to compete on AI for military purposes or whatever else, the nation that regulates its AI and makes it explainable will give its AI such a disadvantage that the other state will win. And I was just like, that's a horrible thought because some kind of balance, some kind of ethics, a set of guidelines and explainability and transparency, and even a kill switch 
uh, is something everyone has to agree to. And it only works if everybody's incentives are aligned. Um, I know that's a big question and you may not be able to answer it, but I thought I would ask, how do you see uh, the various countries collaborating on things like pandemics or um, digital transparency or other issues that don't really know a border? I um, I can speak to, to the AI and ethics side and then I'll let Sam um, talk more on transparency. I, I think it's a, it's a really interesting example that you've raised, but um, but that's very much not what, what I've seen, at least uh, working as a part of the Digital Nations um, AI working group, because in, in this case, we understand that um, when it comes to really emerging issues such as AI in the public sector, there are no winners and losers, really. We all have to work together to advance this agenda. And uh, we've noticed that many countries are facing the exact same issues. And um, and when we're able to map those, then we can, we can essentially come up with solutions together that then we can advance um, in our respective national contexts. And I think this is what we've been trying to do, especially in terms of how do we build capacity in the public sector to, to be... Um, to be able to um, use AI properly, to maybe even build AI uh, properly as well. And um, discussing things like that through this platform really shows us that ultimately we're all working towards the same thing, which is advancing the use of technology in the public sector. And um, at least at this at this stage, I don't see it as, um, as a ri like rivalry necessarily. I think it's more of a collaborative process and we're all just learning as we go. Um, to a large extent, especially when it comes to ethics and all the new dilemmas that emerge uh, every day. Gosia, did you want to chime in on that too? Uh, yeah, just a quick thought. Um, so from my perspective, and I guess from our perspective as, as chair this year, um, not only on the Digital Nations group, but within other groups that we collaborate internationally uh, with other governments in, uh, like the G7, like the G20, um, uh, you know, as, as we were mentioning before, coming up a uh, COP meeting, I think there is uh, definitely, you know, a dose of reality and an understanding that the governments need to make sure they protect the public. And so there is the, you know, economic security aspect and the sort of um, resilience that is part of, of our national strategies. Absolutely, that's true. But the more we do that, I think the more uh, we realize that there is a lot more that kind of unites us that separates when it comes to these like-minded groupings. And therefore there is a greater gain from our collaborations and interactions than just staying within our own borders. Um, and that's something that I think there is a very high political uh, sort of, uh, you know, willingness to. Um, and uh, and that's why we have these collaborations. And, um, and we see that in digital nations, we see that in other um, uh, like-minded uh, sort of groups and and that's why we we're getting the summit now together in 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 november to just reinforce that message and and having our ministers uh meet together and uh and reconfirm that 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 commitment to uh to collaboration and and, and shared values so the dn works with more than 10 governments on a lot of these things um any thoughts on seeing that number grow beyond 10 soon um, that's an interesting question. Uh, so we are currently um, not accepting officially any uh, applications for membership because of the process being paused uh, because of the pandemic. So um, during last year, we were unable to come back to uh, to opening the applications process as we were setting up all of these different, um, you know, uh, kind of ways of working virtually out of the pandemic and dealing with the resources and 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 everything that we had to uh, but we are now coming back to the the point uh, that we are able to do so and so we will be revising the process and then we'll in due course be able to open the application uh process for new members um potentially next year but it's nothing confirmed yet gotcha um so i want to end with one fairly big question and uh, i'd love to hear from all of you sam why don't you go first um it's been said that society is a consensual hallucination, that we all need to believe it exists and then it exists. But if we wake up one morning and everybody decides society doesn't exist, then in two days, everything's done, right? The police don't show up, the banks stop working, the power goes out, we're done. 
there's we need to all believe in this consensual hallucination for it to function and there has been a um a balkanization or a fragmentation of the um hallucinations that people are having partly because of the mechanics of social media and filter bubbles partly because of foreign actors partly because of humans you know trying to fight this constant tension between individuality and collectivism uh trust in government is more important than it's ever been for government to just function. How have the digital nation's member states been using the move from physical to digital to reinforce or inform people so we can avoid this kind of epistemic crisis in democracies? And Sam, I'm going to take that light question and lay it right at your feet first. Wasn't sure where you were going with that one. Uh, so yeah, it's a it's a great question. Um, I will I will try to uh, I'll try to address that. I think what we've tried to do. So it's it's no surprise when I look around the the members of the digital nations that a lot of them are familiar to me through other forums that are focused on things like transparency, accountability, ethics. These are these are all people that are kind of you know public officials that are working on these kind of things day in day out. And absolutely, as you kind of say one of the key things that we're trying to do here through you know particularly the the data group and and I know you know certainly in Natalia's group on AI is is engender and foster that public trust in government and it's it's not easy you know particularly at a time when as you as you as you rightly say there are issues around disinformation there are issues with kind of the fragmentation of society through you know the online the online space um and so what we what we do you know is is that we're all working in in ways that kind of to try and to try and kind of uh, improve this Firstly, I would say in, in my case, open data is a, is a huge way of doing this. You know, all the information that we publish around things like the, the pandemic, the decision making processes that go into making policy decisions, trying to involve uh, as many people from uh, our, our kind of respective countries as possible in the citizen, you know, the citizenship in the policy making processes, really important. It's all about transparency, accountability and public participation and those values uh, are kind of shared across the digital nation uh, countries so so for us you know the work we do in data the work we do in in a number of these groups is all it all comes back to this idea of how do we communicate in a way that actually resonates with uh, you know our, our, our kind of citizens um, so you know what we what we try and do I guess is in terms of making our work more accountable we, we work openly we publish our information. You'll see that there is a, 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 a Data 360 uh, charter that we published. Uh, we, we signed it in Montevideo back in 2019. Um, and that kind of tells you what our kind of collective vision for, for, for digital is. And it also kind of lays out how we will communicate the work we're doing in a way that is accessible and open and, and kind of transparent. So, you know, by taking those kind of measures, by taking those steps and by kind of working in these ways, we're not just kind of putting out the information about the ways that we're doing things, but we're also doing it in a way that's openly collaborative. And so that that fosters more public interest. And as you say, this shift from physical to digital, it actually enables a lot of this stuff to happen. It also creates, you know, huge issues when it comes to, as you say, the spread of disinformation and, and kind of hostile kind of thoughts. But but in a way, actually, we can address those through these other ways of working. So we're kind of, you know, working in a, in a different environment. The, the situation has changed. The landscape has changed dramatically. And all of the, all of the nations in, in the digital nations are kind of looking and trying to address these things. So, you know, I think for us, it feels like a very collegiate kind of response. It feels like something that we're all able to kind of collaborate upon. Um, and it feels like, you know, the work we're doing, it's, it's having an impact. It's having, a, it's having an effect. And you can see that through the various kind of uh, projects and, and kind of the, 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 the um, the products that we'll be unveiling hopefully uh, later this year at the Digital Nations Conference. Um, some of the things we've been working on within our groups uh, really, really kind of demonstrate how we can be more accountable and transparent in the way we work. So I think I think it's something that we're all very cognizant of, and it's something that we're all kind of working on and developing at all times. Um, so yeah, yeah. I just finished reading uh, Mark Older's Infomocracy, which is all about that kind of stuff. How do you fight, fight fake news? And it is it is the, the question of our time. Uh, Natalia, you want to chime in on that? Sure. So I'd say that one of the things that uh, we've all witnessed um, during the pandemic is how levels of trust in government can determine a success or a failure of any digital solutions. And um, I think we've all understood that um, gaining and maintaining public trust is our biggest challenge, especially when innovating with AI, for example. And um, as digital nations, we've agreed on the on the shared approach uh, for the responsible use of AI, which has been guiding us and um, and 
helping us work in a way that uh, that actually advances this trust and some things that um, we all collaboratively aim to do are um, for example, understanding and measuring the impact of AI in the public sector. And, um, and we've been discussing various tools and approaches to doing that in our uh, working group meetings. Uh, the second one, and Sam mentioned that, is uh, being transparent, uh, especially in the context of AI. Uh, things like algorithmic transparency, so um, proactively communicating to people when and in what context we are using AI. Is, um, are those AI systems used to informed decisions, what kind of decisions, what is the appeal process, and um, all the issues like that, basically just being really transparent, uh, really open about that is extremely, extremely key. Um, then providing meaningful explanations about AI decision making and, um, and also providing opportunities for review. And there are some countries such as Canada, for example, um, that have the algorithmic impact assessment that is one way of doing that. And so we've been discussing various other options on how to, how to achieve and provide those meaningful explanations as well. Um, then sharing source codes, uh, sharing any other relevant information, uh, be it through data or just blogs and um, various updates, public communication more broadly. I think that's also really key. And um, finally, providing training, uh, making sure that public officials have uh, relevant skills to work with AI and communicating that to the public as well. I think that's really key because this lack of trust is also based on, um, on the fact that people quite simply don't think that government, governments are able to, to build AI uh, products and services that are good enough or as good as the private sector. That's one of the common assumptions that I've seen in some of the public engagement work that I run. So, um, so skills and building lasting capability uh, for AI work within the public sector is very, very important because this way we can show that actually we are able to do this well and, um, and that can in the long run also increase uh, public trust. Yeah, it does feel like it's not just things like AI, but also when the government says, oh, I don't know, you know, the NHS will save 300 million pounds or some number like that. Um, there's a lot of question about where that number come from. In the US, there's the uh, there's a whole department that sort of puts together budget estimates and is supposed to be nonpartisan. Uh, but trusting that data uh, and showing people how we got there, whether it's electoral data, which is currently under, you know, the third re-examination by a private organization, uh, or it's just budgetary projections or estimates um, showing how that was collected and letting people inspect the supply chain to see where it came from seems like um, a very good way to sort of end that discussion of how do we know but we're still in this very epistemic sort of puzzle right now uh, gosha uh, tell me a little about your thoughts on uh, how we are going to maintain this consensual hallucination we call society that's a very interesting question. And, um, you know, one, one thought that I have is, is basically following on what uh, Sam and Talia has just uh, been talking about in terms of the trust aspect. And it's, uh, it's both, you know, trust in technologies, but also trust in the governments to be able to secure that the technologies are working for the people. And I think um, it might be worth uh, actually mentioning here that the UK government is uh, hosting this year's Future Tech Forum at the end of the year, which is uh, aiming at doing precisely that, at bringing together governments as well as other stakeholders to discuss how to make sure that we work towards uh, a um, one set of frameworks for governance of technologies. And so avoid this whole fragmentation uh, and making sure that we build on, on the trust in technologies and in, in governments, um, as well as ensuring that we know what the accountability is for us as, as uh, officials, but also for other stakeholders that are part to, to this ecosystem. And digital nations will be uh, meeting uh, at the Future Tech Forum to also engage with the wider set of, of countries then and, and make sure that we share uh, experiences and continue with this commitment. Well, we'll put some links to the Future Tech stuff in the uh, Learn More section uh, when we post this video. Uh, just to wrap up quickly, because I know you all have to go back to your day jobs of saving the world and making society run. Um, what, uh, first of all, I guess, uh, Gosha, what's the best way for people to learn more about the DN? 
Well, please go on the website. Uh, that's the first thing to do, really. Uh, and then you're very welcome to uh, reach out to us directly as well. Um, and uh, all of the details to the Secretariat are provided on the website. And we're very happy to engage um, and facilitate any exchanges that and answer questions that you may have. That's great, because we did have last year uh, 79 regions around the world join us for Forward 50. And as, as I'm sure you know, with the regional access pass, we basically let two people from any municipal, regional, state, provincial government. So if any of the DN members uh, have people at their level or within the provincial, state, city level, uh, they're all welcome to join as well. But it would be great to have that many voices as part of the conversation. All right, so uh, on November 4th, we have an afternoon with the Digital Nations. Um, I know we're working with Jordan from your team on what that lineup will be, but attendees are gonna be able to see three case studies from different regions around the world that the Digital Nations has been uh, building in the last 18 months or so largely in un, under an incredible amount of load from the pandemic, from the rapid acceleration of digital adoption, from many of the changes that we've had to face, uh, people being retooled and repurposed. So it has been one heck of a year and uh, we really look forward to seeing what you've been up to. Uh, so thank you all very much for joining me today. Really looking forward to it. And as always, it's great to have you as a partner in putting on Forward 50. And we look forward to welcoming folks from digital nations around the world this November too. Thank you very much.